As I hear from you, as I'm preaching and teaching your word, lead us and guide us into all truth. And Father, as I look into your word, help us all to see and behold wondrous things out of your word today. Let us hear things out of your word that will comfort us, strengthen us, correct us, and give us the application of your word today, Lord. For Lord, you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy of all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. It belongs to you, Lord. And Father, we even pray for those who are in our midst, O oh God, who may need healing. Lord, we want to just pray for Sister Sylvia right now, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you would touch her feet, O oh God, that you would remove all of the aches and the pains and all of the swelling of that is in her feet, O oh God. And Father, we ask that you would touch Brother Stanley right now, Lord. We command his body to we command his blood pressure, Lord, to become normal. We pray and ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would even get to the root cause, O oh God, of his high blood pressure fluctuating, Lord. We command it to become normal from this day forward. In Jesus' name, nothing is too hard for you, God. Nothing is too hard for you. Lord, you said in your word that signs and wonders would follow those who believe. And Father, we believe in your word. We believe in your power. And so, Lord, show yourself strong through your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Glory to your name, Lord. Yes. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Y'all been enjoying this series? The Beatitudes, the attitude you should have as a Christian. And you remember when we first got started in this, we were saying how Jesus took his mount, as our disciples up on a mountain. And in our day and time, we would call it a conference or a workshop. And, yeah. and Jesus realized that, you know, he wouldn't be with them much longer. So he was trying to put as much teaching and much knowledge and wisdom and understanding into his disciples that he could with the time that he had. And so, what we get from these lessons that we've been learning, we see that you don't have to be a five-fold minister, but we need this in our everyday Christian life just to deal with each other and certainly those of the world. And so I just pray that it's been a great teaching about the discipleship program that Jesus had for his disciples. And today we're going to be talking about persecution that we will have as Christians. And Amen. a lot of people in other countries are being persecuted even as we speak. And I pray that I'll give you words of comfort and encouragement today to, so you'll be able to say, well, you know, a lot of people say, I don't think I can go through persecution, but you can. You will. That's all by the grace of God. Can I get amen? Amen. And so we'll get a chance to see Hopefully some of the things that the early Christians went through and some of the things that Jesus warned his disciples during this workshop of what we call the Sermon on the Mount about what they would be going through. Can I get amen? Amen. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to start at verses 10 and we're going to read down through 12. Uh, it's already on the board. Amen. If you would, let us read it together. Let us stand to our feet and just read it together. Are y'all ready? Amen. Yeah. It says, God blesses those who are persecuted because they live for God. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when you are mocked and persecuted and lied about because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted too. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Today we're going to talk about the persecution that Jesus said the disciples would go through and not all those who desire to live godly, you will go through persecution. And when I was looking over my notes and looking at this again, 
what popped in my mind was committed Christians. Because all Christians don't go through persecution. But if you are committed to God, you will go through persecution. Amen. As we will see today. Amen. Mm -hmm. Notice he said there's a blessing. And now I just want to point out very quickly about, though we read verses 10 through 12, he talks about three different types of persecution in these verses if we look at them very carefully. But I want to define what persecution is. And then we're going to talk about the three different kinds of persecution that verses 10 through 12 talked about. Amen. Persecution is defined as to endure suffering for Christ. Anybody been suffering for Christ lately? Amen. I'm not talking about suffering for something that you did, <laughs> but suffering because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Can I get amen? Amen. Persecution also means to be mocked, to be ridiculed. Anybody been mocked or ridiculed because of their stand or because of their relationship with Christ? Oh, yeah. If not, just hang on. Persecution also means to be criticized. Anybody been criticized for the cause of Christ lately? If not, tell your neighbor, hang on. It also means to be treated with hostility or to be martyred. You know, martyr means to die for Christ and for his cause. And as I said earlier, many Christians in other countries and other nations are being persecuted for Christ even as we speak. Can I get amen? Amen. One type of persecution is, uh, we talked, we just read in those verses that bless us when you are reviled. Reviled means to be verbally abused, insulted, scolded, and mocked mm. because you're a Christian. The other kind of persecution is to be hurt, ostracized, attacked, or tortured, and even killed because of your relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the third one is having all manner of evil spoken against you. In other words, people slander you or they curse you or they lie about you because you are a Christian. In Jesus Christ. And uh, as we look at persecution, it lets you see that the early Christians, they paid a price that we today in, in, in America, we don't understand the price that they paid. They paid a great price for us to become the Christians that we are today. And so we should never take it lightly. Some of the things that they went through most of us could go through today. Most of us would have given up and renounced Christ a long time ago. But let me give you an illustration of some of the things they went through so you will not take your salvation lightly. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 36 to 38. In these verses, you'll see two great examples of what it means to be reviled or persecuted. And you'll get a chance to see some of the things that the early Christians went through. And I'm telling you the truth, a lot of us, we wouldn't have went through it. If you read the book of the Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs, a lot of times when Christians were being persecuted, they would cheer each other on not to give up, not to renounce Christ. That's something in it. Amen. They would cheer them on so that they wouldn't deny the faith in Jesus Christ as they were being killed, as they were being martyred. They would cheer them on, tell them, don't give up. Though they threaten you, they put you in a lion's den because early Christians were put in lion dens for the sake of Christ. But the Christians would cheer them on and say, all they had to do was renounce Jesus, but they would not renounce Christ. They were were willing to be put in lion's den. Some of the Christians were tortured at night and used for, for light, but they wouldn't renounce Christ. They had a faith and a trust 
in a relationship with Christ, I pray to God that this generation will begin to have that same relationship that they had. Look what Hebrews 11, 36 says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36. When you get there, say amen. amen. Hebrews 11, 36. Look at some of the things that they went through for the sake of Christ, and we take it lightly. Some were mocked. A lot of us in this day and time, we can't even take the mockings. Somebody say something about you. Our, our flesh is so thin, so thin-skinned, we couldn't take that. Some of them were marked, and their backs were what? Cut open with whips. All because of Jesus Christ. They wouldn't renounce him because of their faith. All they need to do was just, just, just say, I don't want to be a Christian, or, or say I'm no longer a Christian, but they were willing to what? Be beaten. And their backs just ripped open. Others were chained in what? Dungeons. Anybody been chained lately for Christ? Yeah. No. Not in this nation. All for what? Christ. Some died by a stoning. And some were sawed in half. Imagine. Man. All for Christ. You know how we like to say it so easily, for Christ I live, and for Christ I die. I wonder if we really mean that. For Christ I live, and for Christ I die. They showed it in their actions. Saw half and two, killed with a sword. Some went about in skins of sheep and, and goats. What they mean is, they were persecuting the Christians. They would put skins on them and have the hunting dogs to chase them down and kill them. They paid a price for Christianity. Maybe why in this nation, in this country, in other parts of the world, we take it lightly because we haven't paid a price. They paid a price to be Christians. They showed that they really did believe in their faith. Lord, I pray that we really mean what we say and believe what we say. Hmm. Amen. Next verse. Hebrews 11, 36 to 38. They were too good for this world. They wandered over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Hmm. See, they were too good for this world, meaning that they were, this world wasn't even worthy of them. This world didn't even see the value of these people. They, they loved God so much that they were willing to put their life on the line. Now we hear Paul say to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. They meant it too. This is what they were saying. They were saying, my, my faith in God is so strong. To kill me, I'll just be closer to him quicker and faster. And they believed it. Can I get amen? Amen. Having all manner of evil spoken against you. Let's go to Psalms chapter 35, verses 11 through 15. See, a lot of, this is talking about, you know how people can talk evil about you, and we get all upset when people talk evil about us, but you, we need to get used to this because you go, this is a type of persecution. Some of us, we can't stand for people to talk about us, but you have to learn to, to what? Be able to handle people talking about you, people going to lie about you as if you're a Christian, especially when you're trying to do right for God. People have called this a cult because you try to live right for God, and they want to live any kind of way. People will say you're in a cult. People will say all kinds of things when you're trying to live right for God. That's, that's the type of lying and that's the type of slandering you'll get. And if you can't take it, then you'll succumb to the things that they say. Can I get amen? amen. Well, I'll tell you Psalms 35, 11. Let's look at David. You know, when, you, when, you are, uh, when you're persecuted for Christ, the very people that you help, so often are the very people that turn, their, turn against you. That's a type of persecution. 
So Jesus was letting them know on the mountain, you're gonna it's a reward when you are persecuted. You might not get your reward from the world system, but God sees what you're doing. And God will reward you. Can I get an amen? Amen. So look at look at what David said. David, he was persecuted for doing what was right. In verses eleven, look what David said. Malicious witnesses testify against me. They accuse me of crimes I know nothing about. He was persecuted. People lied on him. See, lying on people and slandering people's name, that's a type of persecution. Why? Because you have this decided to live for righteousness and holiness. And so expect people to lie on you. Expect people to slander you. For Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. Verse 12, he said, they repay me evil for good. Mm. See, when you are a Christian, you can do a lot of good to people, but they repay you for evil. You said, I don't deserve this. Know that you're in the company of those who've gone on before you. Amen. David said, they repay me for evil. I mean, repay me evil for good. I am sick with despair. Yet they are, they were ill. I grieved for them. I denied myself by fasting for them, but my prayers returned unanswered. And they would, the bottom line, they were saying, my heart was so committed to these people helping them, I even fasted for them to be well. I fasted that they would get well. I fasted that I didn't need to, they was letting them, I didn't need to fast, but I was fasting with them because my heart was toward them. And now they are spreading all kind of lies against me. They are persecuting me. So know for sure that you're going to be persecuted if you live a committed life for Christ. Put it like that. A committed life for Christ. See, a committed life for Christ is a life that does not compromise God's word. And when you don't compromise God's word, then people begin to hate you. Verse 14, I was sad as though they were my friends or family, as if I were grieving for my own mother. You know how the Lord say, grieve for those who are sad, rejoice for those who are happy? Mm -hmm. he, paid, he done them well and they did him evil. They persecuted him. They said all kinds of things against him. The very people that you try to help will be the people that turn against you. Can I get amen? Amen. So be prepared for that. Jesus wanted his disciples to know these things before they came to pass, so that they would not think it as something strange. Think it not strange, people. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be lied on. The people that you try to bring to Christ will be the ones that will turn against you. But look what he says, be, but be, but they are glad now that I am in trouble. They gleefully join together against me. I am attacked by people I don't even know. They slander me constantly. You know, people are joining in with another lie. When some people lie against you, that lie spreads so much, and then you stop and say, did the person really do that? I don't know, that's what they said. <laughs> so they join in with that lie. They were person. Some people they were saying were persecuted. He didn't even know them. Never heard of them. So thinking that's strange. People lie about the light of the world and that's and they never been. <laughs> so it's just it shouldn't bother us. Amen. People say something about Brother Stanley. Never, never even met him. But we have to be able to know that you're gonna be persecuted when you try to live right for God. Mm. Can you get an amen? amen? Who are the persecuted? In other words, the person who decide the, the person who decides to live right for Christ, then you what become persecuted. Can I get an amen? amen? They're the ones who they, they stand up for what they believe in. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, verses 29 through 30. Talking about persecution today. Matthew chapter 23. 
verses 29 and 31. Look what Jesus said. What sorrow awaits you teachers of Israel, religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed and you decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. And what Jesus is saying is the very people that were persecuting him in his ministry, which were described in the Pharisees, in the very same ones that said they want they, they, they made tombs for the fathers and the prophets that they killed. And so they were saying if we had been around, we would have, we would have worshipped them. But Jesus is saying that's not so. The very people that y'all have monuments for today, the people of old killed them. Mm. Because of what? They decided to live right. So it's a paradox. You know, the people that say, I want to live right for God, they're the very same ones that persecute you for trying to do what is right. And that's what Jesus was trying to get us to see here. In Matthew 22, let me read again. He says, But sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed. And he said, The very people... And that day, you killed them. You had them killed. You had them persecuted. Yep. But today, you saying if they were living in this day and time, you would have worshipped them. You would have you would have followed their lead. You would have listened to their message. In other words, but he said you killed them, and you decorate the monuments of godly people your ancestors destroyed. And it says, then you say, if I had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would never have joined. Them be killing the prophets. So Jesus is saying, it's a paradox. You say you want righteousness. You want holiness. You want God's messengers to come and speak truth and life to you. But you kill them. One generation will praise them. The generation that you're in, put it like this, the generation that you're in, when you're trying to live for righteousness, those are the ones that persecute you. And the generations come after you, they try to say that if I had been living, I would have listened to the message. But Jesus said, not so. The same heart and attitude that you have against him or his disciples is the same heart and attitude that caused the prophets to be killed in previous generations. Is this making sense? Amen. And he said, but, in verse 31 says, but in saying that you testify, but in saying that you testify against yourselves that you are indeed descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Jesus said, y'all are, are the same descendants of the ones that murdered the prophets. Y'all are just like you did, you're doing to us in this generation, just like they would have done. They persecuted those who preach righteousness and holiness, and y'all are doing the same thing in this generation. But you said you would have honored them. Can I get amen? amen? You know how people always say, if I had heard that, I would have I would did that. I would live right. If I had a just if I had a heard that message they getting, I would have, I would have done right. So Jesus said, no, that's not so. The same rebellious spirit that y'all are persecuting me and my disciples with is the same spirit that they persecuted the prophets of old and even Adam killed. Can I get amen? Amen. Jesus, like all great leaders, make sure you understand in advance what you're getting into. Remember, he said, blessed are those who are persecuted, right? No, any good leader, he's going to always let you know what you're getting into. Can I get an amen? amen? He didn't sugarcoat it. Let's go to Luke chapter 21, uh, verse 12. Remember, we started out with Jesus, how he said, blessed are those who are persecuted. He let them know up front. He was letting the disciples know up front what they were going to be up against. If you tell people that they are all great days in, in, in Christianity, you're lying to them. You're deceiving them. And so when the, the hard times come, they fall by the wayside. You didn't prepare them for truth. You must prepare them for what is going to happen. Jesus, he never allowed those who followed him to say that they followed him blindly. Now, I can't promise you that you won't be persecuted. I can't promise you that you won't have the, the three different types of persecution that is listed in Mark, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. 
If you're a committed Christian, you're going to go through these different types of persecution. So we, uh, Jesus was telling the disciples they must expect this. But at the same time, there's a blessing when you go through. For the Lord's sake, amen. Look what Jesus told them earlier when they were following him. Luke 21, verses 12. But before all this occurs, there will be what? A time of great persecution. He promised and he told them this, right? There will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons. So he didn't let them get into something that they were not aware of, did he? He was letting them know in advance what, what to expect. We should expect persecution. Amen. The darker things get in our day and time, the more persecution is going to occur in more violent ways. So Jesus was letting them know what to expect. And he said, you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are what? My followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. That sounds funny, don't it? What? Tell them about you? I'm trying to get myself out of this. But Jesus said, this is your greatest chance, your greatest opportunity to witness. Think about that. You're being persecuted. Most of us, when we're persecuted, if we don't understand this, the last thing on our mind will be, we'll be trying to get out of this with <laughs> rather than trying to witness about Christ. Amen. But Jesus said, this is your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you. Jesus let them know during your time of the persecution, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you that. Verse 15 said, For I will give you the right words and such wisdom, and none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute. Now we know the good illustration of that verse would be what Stephen. That's why they stoned Stephen. They, they came against him with all of the wisdom that they thought they had, and God gave Stephen the wisdom as what to say, and it made him so mad, and they threw stones at him even hard. And when he was dying, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Mm -hmm. So the same spirit that was on Jesus, it was on Stephen. Amen. In verse 16, it says, even those closest to you, Wow, this is happening in a lot of nations now, even as we speak. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair of your head will perish. For Jesus is telling them, all that's going to take place, all of this type of persecution... It's going to come upon committed Christians. I have to keep saying that because if you're not committed Christian, then no persecution like this will come to you because you're like a closet Christian. Because mm. when you really stand up for God, then people are going to hate you. People are going to come against you. But we have a lot of people that they won't even tell people that they are Christian, so you won't be persecuted as much as the people who are what, committed. A committed person, they really mean it when they say, for God I live and for God I die. They don't mind telling you that they're Christian, even at the expense of their life. They know that they're gonna, it's going to cause you to lose some friends. You're going you're gonna to lose some friends. You're going to lose some people along the way. You're going to lose some family members, what Jesus was saying, because of his sake. But that's why he said the kingdom of heaven is yours. When it's all said and done, your eyes is on the kingdom. Kingdom business. Christians suffer persecution because they are not of this world. Let's go to John 15 and 19. We're talking about what causes persecution. In other words, you need to know what causes persecution. So not only will you expect it, but you, you can be, be prepared for it. John 15, 19. <clears throat> Again, look what Jesus said. The world would love you as one of his own if you belong to me. But you are not no longer part of this world. 
I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. 